Sorry, everybody, but uh, we are on a serious time constraint tonight. Uh, we really appreciate everybody coming and uh, being prompt and getting to their seats. Uh, the Savannah Theater has been gracious uh, enough to host us here tonight, and we need to return that favor by making sure that we are out of here by 7 o'clock so they can go about uh, their ordinary business this evening. Uh, so I really appreciate everybody uh, working with us uh, on that schedule. Um, before we get started, I guess, you know, I, whenever I have a microphone in front of me, I can't resist uh, the opportunity to talk about the importance of, of planning. And I know we're going to talk a lot about planning and design tonight, um, but I, I, think, I feel like it's especially important right now. You know, it's, all, it's always very easy to get mired in the day-to-day -day concerns and, and issues uh, of our lives. And, you know, it's normal. It's what we all have to do to get through the day or the week or the month. But we do, from time to time, need to take a step back and really think about the long term. You might do that in your own personal life. You might think about where you want to be in five years or, or ten years and, you know, try to set up, you know, a, a plan for that. And as a community, we have to do that as well. And it's important to really take stock and figure out where do we want to be together. Because uh, if we don't do that, we end up sort of stumbling uh, into the future. It's also always important to remember that the issues that we grapple with today, whether they're good things or whether they're things that worry us, are often the accumulation of decisions that were made many years ago, sometimes even decades ago. And in city building, the decisions that we make today often aren't felt uh, tomorrow or the next day. They, they tend to take years and they tend to take many different actions by many different people. And I think about that when I think about Savannah a lot, because I, I feel like uh, all of us who are here today in 2016, we are enjoying uh, a tremendous gift uh, that was given to us by uh, people who have, you know, most of whom have long since passed away. And the beautiful streets, the buildings, the public squares, everything that we enjoy was really created by generations of people uh, acting over many, many different years uh, from all walks of life. And I think we have to, you know, ask ourselves, how are we going to pay it forward? I'd like everybody to think about that tonight, especially when you hear Mayor Riley uh, speak and talk about, uh, about his work. But what are we leaving for the next generation and the generation after them? What are our values and how do we intend to prioritize them? And that's really the sum and substance of this speaker series, the Savannah Urbanism Series, uh, that we've been able to set up. The first session uh, that we did in February explored the dollars and cents uh, of urbanism. Uh, if you couldn't attend, uh, we do have videos of that uh, on uh, the SDRA website at www.sdra.net, not .com, but .net. Um, the morning session that is on there is about an hour and a half long. So, you know, my, my suggestion is, you know, sit back with a glass of wine and put it on a screen somewhere that's large and just enjoy it. Uh, but I promise that you'll never uh, think about your city uh, or the cities that you experience uh, the same way ever again. And so before we get into the program, I want to highlight one other thing uh, that's coming up uh, that's also relevant to our uh, discussions about planning and design. The Congress for the New Urbanism, who, which is an organization that I've been involved with for about 20 years or so, and I've kind of always felt like these were, in, in many ways, the brightest minds nationally and, and internationally uh, in city making and, and design, uh, they will be having their 26th annual conference here in Savannah in May of 2018, so about a year and a half from now. That will bring about 2,000 people uh, to our city who are really going to dive deeply into local issues. Uh, the local co-host chairs for this are myself uh, and Eric Brown. Eric, you want to raise your hand? So right down here in front. If you are interested in this, if you'd like to volunteer and help in any way, we think this is going to be a pretty big deal uh, for Savannah. We're very, very excited about it, and we certainly need help. Uh, so it's going to be quite an undertaking, and we really look forward to, to your help. And then finally, I want to thank everybody who agreed uh, to donate money tonight uh, to America's Second Harvest. Obviously, uh, they have had a, a very, very busy couple of weeks and have literally fed thousands and thousands of people and families and uh, will continue to do so for a while. So uh, actually give yourselves a round of applause for that. So 
So about a year and a half ago, I was having lunch uh, with Dickie Mopper, and uh, we kind of sat down. We were going over a lot of our usual business, and he, uh, he said that uh, he told me he wanted to create uh, an urbanism series. And uh, I couldn't have been more excited uh, when he told me this. It's something that really fits very neatly with the things that I care about. And, and we've worked really hard uh, as a team to make this into something that we, uh, we hope all of Savannah can be proud of and very interested in. Uh, so with that, I'd like to introduce Dickie Mopper, the president of Angle and Volker Savannah and NAIA Mopper Benton, who will introduce our speaker. Real quick before I get started, um, we do have a jar out front too if anybody wants to make a contribution to American Harvest um, right on the front table and I'm sure they would love that. Um, I also want to thank England Volker, Savannah and NAI Mopra Benton, but the Savannah Development Renewal Authority, one of the other sponsors, Brown Design Studio, Thomas and Hutton Engineering, Longleaf Partners, in the Downtown Neighborhood Association. Without everybody's help and support, we could not be doing this tonight. And without fail, we want to thank the Savannah Theater, um, and particularly Matt Meese, for allowing us the opportunity to use this, this uh, fine facility tonight, and we're all honored to be here. I'm really, really fortunate tonight to have the opportunity to introduce someone who is not aware of this, but he is my civic hero. Years ago, I decided that I wanted to get involved in Savannah politics, and I had watched Mayor Joe Riley for years and thought that it was amazing the things that he was able to do in Charleston. When I decided to run, I called Mayor Riley, who really didn't know me, and he and his team spent time with me and talked to me about urbanism, talked to me about good town planning, planning, Kevin's word, such an important thing. And I never forgot it, and I always appreciated it. You know, we as Savannah are, are honored tonight to have the opportunity to hear from Joe Riley, um, who has spoken in Savannah before, and to hear him again. He's the renowned mayor of our sister city, Charleston. And no question that in this country is one of the most respected leaders of all time. The things that he's done in Charleston are remarkable. He took office in 1972, and when he took office, he had vision, he had hope, and he had plans. He thought that King Street was in need of revitalization, that it needed changes, and he communicated with business leaders along the street and worked with developers from outside of his community and even though they had stumbling blocks, his courage and fortitude led them to taking King Street to one of the most famous shopping streets in America today. You know, just great, great vision. The other things that he's done is to take the citizens of his city and make them all part of the decision. You know, when he became mayor, he decided that council should be the face of the city, and he did that. He did that by creating seats for all people in his community. And that open communication, I think, has had a lot to do with his success in Charleston. Obviously, he transformed, transformed Charleston into a cultural mecca, from Spoleto um, all the way down to the, the Southeastern Wildlife Exposition. Truth be known, Mayor Riley will go down in history as one of the greatest mayors this country has ever seen. But his successes in all of the things we've talked about really are not what make him a great leader. It's the dark times in Charleston, Hurricane Hugo, a horrible massacre in a church, the ability of his leadership to work with his entire community to come together and to face these things when other cities might have crumbled. It is with great, great honor that I introduce to you Mayor Joe Riley, Charleston, South Carolina. Well, 
Dickie, thank you so much for your most generous words. And uh, thank you and your colleagues for inviting me to be a part of the Urbanism Speaker Series. Uh, and it's wonderful to be in this most beautiful American city, Savannah. And we've got lots of friends here from longstanding and new ones. Uh, certainly pleased to be with Mayor DeLoach and uh, his city council. And uh, thank all of you for giving your time tonight to listen to me for a while. And I know that I need to get you out before 7 o'clock. If I don't, you'll start leaving anyway. Um, I'm going to show you some images tonight. Uh, and I'm going to talk about the city, the reality and the future, the promise, the greatness of the city, the greatness of your city, Savannah, which I've admired for a long time. A city should be a place where every citizen's heart can sing. Charleston, like Savannah's an old city, it was laid out pursuant to a model. Uh, it was built before the automobile and the elevator, a city of remarkable human scale and physical beauty. A city that uh, withstood the ravages of war and, and earthquakes. But a city that isn't a, a theme park and it's not preordained and it's not magic, it's a real live American city filled with all the hopes and, and opportunities for achievement and mistakes and failures as well. This was a mistake. This was a demolition of the historic Charleston Hotel in the 50s. Now that hotel is where the Democratic Convention of 1860 met. Uh, one of the most beautiful and historic hotels in America, but it was demolished because the city leaders back then knew to be a great city, you had to have a drive-in motel. But you couldn't be a great city without a drive-in motel. So the challenge of this business of city planning and development starts with not making any mistakes. Do everything you can to make sure that you're not making any mistakes. We started working in the poor sections of our city because the restoration of a city is a holistic thing. It's got to include everybody, it's all part of one organic thing, the greatness of people in a city. So we started with the vacant lots. I was determined to build a, a handsome housing in vacant lots. This is what houses look like in these neighborhoods. They were framed, they addressed the sidewalk. But back in the 50s and 60s when they built affordable housing, they just stuck them in a lot, set them back out of scale, usually put a cyclone fence around it to tell you it was unsafe and nobody really should want to live there. And um, so I was determined that we could find a way to build beautiful, affordable houses. So we had an architectural competition, found a young architect, and he did that, which was long before new urbanism. It was in the uh, at 77, but he had the courage to design something that looked like its surroundings and was familiar, it was beautiful, and it didn't cost any more than the ugly stuff. Housing Authority built it for us. So luckily we had that experience when Housing Authority got a grant for a new public housing project. They called me and said, Mayor, we're so excited we got the grant, 152 units, we're gonna tear down some buildings, one block and the other. I said, we're not building any more projects. They said, Mayor, you, you don't understand, we got a long waiting list. You're going to, you, you, you're going to be in serious trouble, you might get impeached. I said, no. We're not building this anymore. This ignored all the accumulated lessons of Western civilization about towns and cities. And you build these brick model this, crowd a bunch of poor people in there and then complain when they don't work. They said, we're not gonna do that anymore. We're going to scatter the public housing on vacant lots in the city. Well, they thought I was nuts. I was young and, you know, and ill-informed. Um, but we started, I insisted, and we started looking for the lots. And that, you know, that creates a little de debate in the community. I mean, the average person I'd wake up in the morning and say, honey, wouldn't it be good if we got some public housing next door in that vacant lot? So we had the, you know, we had the debates with the neighborhoods and worked on that and then compromised. And anyway, we bought the lots and then we hired the architect, told them what you wanted. They came up with the plans, the ugliest said, we fired them, got some other architects. And then this is what we built. 
Now that's owned by the housing authority. Really poor people live there. When Prince Charles came to Charleston, the only photo op he wanted was our scattered site public housing. Uh, it, it fits in the neighborhood. Um, it belongs and you're the resident of a home. A child who lives in one of these apartments when he's at school and he says, where do you live, son? He says, I don't live at 7E, I live at 143 Cumming Street, you know, across from the church. When we had the ribbon cutting for these, or we were opening them, I was at a cocktail party at the president of one of our colleges uh, home and, um, and a crush of people at a cocktail party and a server came up to me um, with a tray of drinks or food or something and uh, she got close to me and she whispered and she said, Mirali, I want to thank you. And I was that for, ma'am? He said, because Monday I'm moving into 7 Marion Street. That's one of these. And it's so beautiful. And I thought maybe this was a long time ago that maybe in America the prospective tenant of public housing and it beats the rats in the rain, but with a few syllables had not used the word beautiful before. And the fact of the matter is this. In the city, there's never any excuse to build anything, allow anything to be built that doesn't add to the beauty of a city, whatever it is, whether it's housing or anything. Now, now, this scattered site public housing is really poor people, but good design. And you know, people, almost all people are good people. Whether you got money or you don't have money. And I make for good neighbors too. So anyway, we built these across the street. These were run down. They got restored by the private sector. A vacant lot next door, market rate housing ran on that. Vacant lot around the corner, market rate housing ran on that. One building, two apartments, beautiful design with poor people being, became a catalytic agent to restore a neighbor. Then we worked, as you've done here so wonderfully, in, in keeping old buildings from being demolished. So this was a really poor neighborhood. We were working hard on those neighborhoods, and we wouldn't let them come down. The, you know, the buildings are memories. They're, they're the past. They're the fabric and the scale and the texture of a city. All these are affordable housing. We did a few hundred in these neighborhoods, a multifamily, single family, that was a, that was, she was burned. And they would go tear it down. We said, no, got one of our nonprofits we created to restore it. And I took these pictures one Saturday afternoon because I love this, the thought of a person of modest means uh, having a third floor piazza overlooking the 19th century roofscape of our city. Then these were what we call Freedman's Cottages, what, what, what African-Americans built after the Civil War when they could legally own land. It was one story version of a single house, but the neighborhood was about gone. Hurricane Hugo almost took them down, but we knew we had to save them because of that building type and the neighborhood. So we worked with Habitat. It was the first Habitat restoration project in America. All of the new construction, they worked with us. We restored them, the single houses, and saved the neighborhood. But then it, it taught us the building type. We were trying to figure out, what do you build for transitional houses? We had a beautiful shelter for the homeless. And, uh, and so somebody's making a little bit of money, and they can get out on their own a little bit. So what does a transitional housing look like? So a young architect designed this. And that won an award from the AIA, trans, uh, transitional housing. Um, and our scattered site public housing won an award for the President of the United States. He had 11 awards for a 25-year period. 25 years just gave 11 awards for design-related things, and our housing for the poor scattered site won a national award. Things that so often you'd have said, well, you know, it really doesn't matter. It's just. You can never say in a city it's just. If a human being can see it, it should add to the beauty of a city and add to the inspiration of the city, whatever it is, public housing, transitional housing, whatever. Now, this was a house obviously not in very good shape. And um, so the building official nicely called me to tell me they were going to let the demolition permit come down on this house on Fishman Street. I said, no, you can't. He said, Mayor, it is going to fall, and it's, it's shifting. And it is true that the utility pole was vertical, precisely vertical, and it was leaning a little bit. <laughs> And I said, well, you know, we get somebody to fix it up. And they said, it's going to fall on the house next door and kill the people. I said, well, let's move the people out. And uh, so we, we moved them into the Holiday Inn for a couple of months. They thought it was kids, kids, kids swam in a pool. And then we put some money in it. And it was not in good shape, I admit, but we fixed it up. 
made it affordable housing. Now, this house really had three lives. So we did that. I wish I had other pictures for you. Then later years, the highway department was building a big bridge, needed to widen that ramp. So they wanted to take it down. We said, no, we got to move it back six feet. And then we got up in the highway department, and then the buildings around it were seedy, and then vacant lots. We did a wonderful combination of, uh, I forget how many units, but uh, rental, uh, market rate rental, uh, low income rental owned by the housing authority and, and single family, some first time home buyers and others. It's a beautiful neighborhood, but if we let that one house come down, uh, it, it would never have been there. You, lo you lose a corner, you lose the fabric, and everything falls apart. These were owned by the medical university. They wanted to tear them down. They needed to tear them down to build a park garage. We got them to give them to us and move them to a vacant corner lot on a street that was, that was stubbed by a cross town coming through in the 60s. So uh, it was right this this corner and um, vacant. And so we got the houses, they gave them to us, we moved them and restored them for affordable housing. And um, now this next picture I took um, looking out of that uh, second floor balcony closest to you, looking down the street. I'd become really attached to this little street because I'd go by and check on the construction and there's this wonderful tree growing out of the sidewalk and the tree, and the street, kind of, you know, like the highway department had noticed it yet, or they'd have cut it down. And, um, but it was this charming tree. But right under this tree was this awful looking thing. So I told our people we needed to get 15 and a half Cracking Street and the building fish called said, Mayor, it's going to fall down. I said, well, let's go take a look at it. He said, Mayor, it might fall on us. Seriously, this is not good. And uh, it's true, the utility box had become structural. They couldn't take it off the house. But anyway, we put money in it, restored it for affordable housing. And, um, and when we had the ribbon cut in there, a lady came up to me and she said, Mayor Riley, I want to thank you. And I said, what's that for, ma'am? She said, because people used to ask me where I lived, and I was afraid to tell them, embarrassed, because everybody knew how ugly Cracky Street was. And she said, now nah, I can't wait for people to ask me, because everybody knows how nice Cracky Street is. We work hard on our downtowns, as you have done so wonderfully here in Savannah. And so often people say, why, 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 why? And, and well, you, you, you know, the jobs and tax base and all of that, we argue. But the, but the reason is, most important reason is it's the public realm. For a healthy and alive downtown is, is the civic realm. It's, it's the democratic space. The hustle and bustle and felt ownership of everyone who walks along it uh, gives, gives, gives life and spirit to a city. So our King Street was about going. I went there shopping the day before Christmas after I got elected because the election was in December. And, um, and I parked behind Marty's building to walk through to the street. And there was no one on the street. Day before Christmas. The main shopping district of coastal South Carolina when I was growing up was essentially dead. So we did it by the numbers. And you have to have a strategic plan in city building or in business or anything, you gotta have a plan. You gotta know what you're going and it's gotta be solid. You gotta stick with it and keep revisiting it to make sure you're on track. So we, we study the buildings, what they used to be and put some grant money in this one they were gonna tear down, we wouldn't let them and put some money in it, got apartments, started getting apartments on the second, third floor, shops on the first floor. And this was a Swartz building, we were so proud to get that fixed up old Mr. and Mrs. Schwartz, and doggone if Hugo didn't knock it down, so we got another one in there. So we were making progress, but this was our big challenge. Had this huge vacant lot right in the middle of downtown. King Street, our main shopping street, is a street to your left of dog legs. Uh, that was the 100% the shopping district, South Carolina, on this vacant lot, but once two department stores when I was a child. Then Meeting Streets, Parallel Street, and then Market, is the intersection. So our strategic plan said that you need critical mass there. Lots of critical mass that will connect Market Street. You see the red roof to your right. And Market Street was starting to come back a little bit. Now Market Street had a checkered path and it was once written that Market Street was the only street in America where for 50 cents you could get a tattoo, a bowl of chili, or a communicable disease. But, <laughs> but it, it had... Um, it had gotten a lot better, 
and um, so they were starting to revive, but, but we needed people to walk from Market Street to King Street, and human beings do not walk past a vacant lot in an urban setting. You just don't do it. So we needed to connect. It had to be a lot of stuff, and uh, we had to have parking and all of that. It became very controversial. This was back in the late 70s and um, early 80s because people, people are afraid of, of density. And, of course, cities were always dense. One of the cities were dense. But then the suburban experience made us think that the option was sparse, uh, in habitation, and um, so it was controversial. Um, we knew we had to respect the scale of the city. Um, we knew we needed to respect the market hall, to move the street back uh, six feet to your left, just to center it. Insisted on retail, good urban design, not too high, setback, and all of that, and, uh, and that was built. Uh, Charleston Place. Now, details are so important in this. Like in everything, any business you're in, the details are important for you to be successful. So two interesting details on this project. The, the, uh, one is the upper left I'll talk about right now, and the upper right is the parking, which is obvious, and I'll talk about that in a few minutes. So on the upper left, that was going to be the conference facility or the, the banquet hall. And um, so the pre-assembly space where you come down to the elevator, or if you come into the hotel, you go up the steps, and then you go there for the drinks before the event. So they wanted the uh, pre-assembly space to be overlooking the church. You can see where the church is right there. And it's a, you know, nice view and all of that. But that meant that the kitchen space in back of the house would be on the street side, on the second floor. And I said, we y'all can't do that. And they said, "Why?" Well, I said, "Because the, in a, you, you don't have you don't have closed windows or back of the house space on a street in a city. You don't do that. And uh, we're trying to energize the street and enliven the street. And you can't do that. You got to move the pre-assembly space. I mean, the kitchen by the church and the pre-assembly space to King Street. So it cost them more money, but to their credit, they did it." So this is a pre-assembly space. You look out over King Street, you know where you are, and then from the street you see it. It's communicating the energy, it's civic. It's you part of it. It's the life of the city. Probably 75 buildings were restored just by getting the right catalytic agent in place. And one day, some years after, maybe not too many years after it opened, I was walking down King Street about where these gals are, um, Sunday, I'd go get the New York Times after church, and I saw a fellow walking towards me, and he was out of place. He was married, retired, great guy, lived in the suburbs, and it was noon on Sunday, and he was walking by himself down King Street. So I was nervous, like maybe something happened to him, whatever. So we approached each other. I said, Harold, how are you doing? He said, fine. I said, what you doing down here? Now, he said, well, Joe, and he started, you know, kind of getting flushed like I'd caught him and he was going to have to reveal an emotion, which we guys never want to do, of course. And he said, well, uh, uh, Joe, uh, uh, Doris and I, well, we went to early church and she had some chores to do around the house. And he said, Joe, quite honestly, I just like to come down here and walk around because it looks so nice and I'm so proud of it. And that, that's why, that's why it's so important to engender that, that, sense of ownership and pride the cities have in the city. Now, this is an office building that got built. But before then, this is it, the market hall you see there, and that's Charleston Place on the right after it got built. And uh, so it was a abandoned gas station. And these guys wanted to build the office building, which they built. And I wanted to get rid of the abandoned gas station because for two reasons. It was a, ga a abandoned gas station. But there was a billboard above it. I mean, a billboard way up, you know, you could see. And the, you know what the billboard said? It said, if you like Charleston, you will love Savannah. It really did. And, you know, that was embarrassing. And, I mean, I get that billboard down, I would do almost anything. And um, 
So I told the guys, I said, now that, that office y'all going to do this for, they built it. I said, that's going to be really nice. We need some retail on the street, on Market Street. And they said, Joe, look, our people don't want any mixed use. And I said, well, uh, they need to buy some land from us from behind. In the back, we had a parking lot. And, um, and I said, well, I won't sell you the land. And they said, Joe, you, we will be able to do this. We're going to go broke. I said, well, look, at what did William H. Holly White, who wrote about how people used in New York City in the 60s with Jane Jacobs and all. And, and he said, you know, up on Madison Avenue, when the rest of New York wasn't doing very well, because every 22 feet there was another storefront. So he keeps moving up the street. So people don't like walking past draperies or blank walls in an urban setting. So they reluctantly agreed to build, put retail, and then they later told me that's the best idea they ever had because they got more money. So you got, you know, little things like that. And now this couple was having a perfectly good time until I took their picture. They wondered what the hell I was doing. But they were looking at the jewelry, you know, and moving down the street. And then at the other end of that block, we get Saxeth Avenue to come where there was a... a kind of a awful-looking one-story bank building there. And that was a great achievement for us. And uh, so they got good design and nice storefronts on King Street and then on the side street, Market Street. But across the street, we had the Riviera Theater that, um, that was abandoned, but we got it and put money in it, got a developer, and he agreed to fix it up beautifully. But on the side of the theater, now you're across from the sacks with all their storefronts coming online, is this blank wall and you know the very narrow sidewalk so I told the developer I said can y'all put some storefronts along and they said well Joe we can but you know it's a narrow street so best we can do is you know punch some holes in it like that which that that, that really doesn't work because it's shady and then trash gets blown in there and everything and I said well, what would it take to put some storefronts in there so well Joe you got a narrow sidewalk and you have to widen the sidewalk so I sent a note to our folks that said we need to widen the sidewalk on Market Street. And um, so they very politely said, we talked with DOT and we can't because if you, if you widen the sidewalk, you're going to have to narrow the street. And I said, well, you know, I was always good at math and I'd actually figured that out earlier. And um, so I said, what, what does DOT say is wrong with uh, narrowing the street? And they said, well, if you narrow the street, you'll have two nine-foot lanes and so if a beer delivery truck is illegally parked in one moving lane of traffic, that if a Greyhound bus comes down the street, which they didn't come down that street anymore, but if they did, if they got lost and came down the street, that the rearview mirrors would hit. And I said, well, what if we don't let the beer truck illegally park? And um, so we got the sidewalk widened, and so instead of that, you got this. It isn't a good picture, but that extra two feet we got a street tree and then the lamppost. And you know, so often as we wrestle with the decline and the redevelopment of American city, we just said, Lord have mercy, we cannot inconvenience the beer trucks. When, <laughs> when the question is this, if a mother is walking her child down the street, is it a nice space? Does she feel like it belongs to her? And that extra two feet, it meant the world, and it's a beautiful place. We had this terrible fire on Upper King Street. Upper King Street was hanging on by a thread as we were starting to work on Lower King Street. I was there, the brave firefighters contained it to one building. How they did it, I do not know. They're amazing. And that's what it looked like in the morning when the building official called me 10 minutes after date and said, Mayor, we're going to let the demolition permit for the Bluestein building, that was the name. And I said, no, you're not. They said, Mayor, it's going to fall on the street and kill people. And I said, well, we, we barricade the street. Because what I knew was this. That was a landmark building built by an immigrant Jewish family, beautiful building, and if it comes down, what happens? That's a disease that spreads. In a, in a, or in a retail street, you got a corner, there's no economic activity going on there. The disease spreads. The other one becomes vacant, and it comes down. So we, we had to buy the facade from the owner, which we did, shorted it up. And then the great guy, he said, now, may I, somebody told me you want a, a, a two-, three-story building back there. I said, yeah, people think I'm dumb to say the facade and got a one-story building. And he said, well, nobody ran it. I said, well, you build it, we'll rent it. 
we, we can always use some space. So um, so they built it. We ran it for a few years now. Mark, of course, the market forces took over. and But you know that one building and that part of town, saving that and restoring, first of all, it was a resurrection ethic, the restoration ethic, that, that boy, this, this, this place has a future. And, and then one by one, and it's the most thing, Upper King Street is absolutely amazing with the ending. But if we lost that one building, uh, it just would have never been the same. Now, parking is a challenge in American City. We built this parking garage, um, so you know what it looks like. But when we were working with the architects, and we had to build a parking garage, and it was on East Bay Street. We needed it there because we were going to do the park show in a minute. And it was just, it's a half a block from the Exchange Building, which is one of the most historic buildings in America, where the Declaration of Independence for our, was was ratified by a state and where the constitution was ratified by a state. So I said to the architect, I said, now, this was a long time ago, I said, we need a parking garage that looked like one. And the architect was so respectful, you know, here condescending, but respectful. And he said, well, um, he said, well, Mayor, you, you don't, obviously do not understand an architecture form follows function. A building should look like what it is. And I said, no, I, I, I actually heard that. Louis Sullivan said that, built his uh, buildings in uh, Chicago. But, um, but that, uh, that doesn't mean, that doesn't apply here. And um, I said, I want the louvers. And so he didn't want to do that. So he sent me renderings. He, he was going, give me some louvers at the top but it's like you had to see the car. It wasn't fair to him to design a parking garage you couldn't see the car. So I got a police photographer to take pictures of all these buildings with closed shutters around town. So they relented and we built it. And, um, and you know that I won an award from the National Endowment for the Arts. And, uh, and the director of the endowment of the arts, Frank Hossel, this was years and years ago, came for the ceremony, and I thought his staff had briefed him, and we had a law officer and then sandwich stop and all that. And, um, and so we walked past the parking garage and, um, to eat lunch for the ceremony, and he said, by the way, Joe, by the way, Joe, show me where the parking garage is. I said, Frank, we just walked past it. And, um, but, but the fact is, it, it's respectful. It adds to the beauty rather than distract the beauty from the city. And then this is another, on the Charleston Place, I showed you the parking. We needed a big parking deck. It would have been easy to tear down these buildings. I mean, they were junky, nothing worthwhile going there. A couple had been burned out. There was a striptease joint and other things. But we knew we needed to save the sods. So we bought the buildings, let the owner keep them if they wanted, and keep the back. I mean, we take the back, they keep the front, or we'd buy the whole thing. So we bought the whole thing a few times. So once, so for a while, the city owned a building that had a strip joint in it. And um, so the male members of my legal department insisted that they had to inspect it nightly just to make sure it was safe. Anyway, so we, uh, we built a parking garage behind it, cut off the back. And uh, so rather than a, you know, a harsh-looking building there something really in scale. And I took this picture just after they opened. They'd be, at this time of night, there are probably 30 people waiting to get in one of the restaurants. But see, that couple's in charge. That space is theirs. That's, that's the goal of a city, to give the citizens, it's their space, it's their sidewalk, it's their city, it's in human scale, it belongs to them. And there's a park, and it's very handsome, and then, you know, behind the and the alley, just a natural thing. You have an alley, you come to the parking, on the street you got nice buildings. We put uh, a park, we put gardens in our parking garages and trees in our parking lots and flowers, everything to beautify. Now, Charleston was built on water. In the 18th century, uh, closest to you, they respected the water and created that. And then the end of the uh, 19th and early 20th century to the south, the battery. Water's edge to the public a basic uh, understanding about cities on water. And um, so we had our challenge in after I was elected, what you see there on the uh, Cooper River side was once shipping terminal and it burned in the 50s and it languished for about 25 years. Just burned out piling, scruffy surface parking lot. And a couple 
who were connected to Charleston approached me and said they would give money to help make it a park if the city would put money in. And uh, about that time, a guy bought the property and was going to build the Venice of the Southeast. And big deal and all of that. And um, so I told him that we wanted to build a park. And he said, well, he wanted to build the Venice of the Southeast. And I said, well, and he was a good guy. We got to be good friends later. But um, I said, well, we, 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 will go in, we will condemn your property for public use. And um, he really didn't like that. And um, so he called me a Hitler-like dictator. Um, but what I knew was, you know, sometimes we can make, we make 50-year decisions. And sometimes we make... 300-year decisions that will be benefiting or harming our city. And I knew that was one of those 300-year decisions to give this beautiful piece of the water's edge to the public. So we, we and eventually we worked it out. A guy found, figured out a way we could swap land and all this kind of stuff. And so it worked out, and he got to be real happy about it eventually. And when we had the deed signing of the park, there was a cocktail party after deed signing, and he got up in front of everybody and told them that I reminded him of Winston Churchill. So I got up and I said, well, Bill, that's a different historical figure than you mentioned not too long ago. But anyway, so then we um, studied you. When you build something in a city, an old city, you want to make it feel natural. And so we studied what the city used to be like, had great design, arch, or landscape architects and architects, beautiful uh, work. And uh, so that's a plan we came up with. And um, it was controversial, you know, reasonably. Why does city need park? Parks take property off tax books, money to maintain, where do people go to park, stuff like that. And um, But we, we raised some private money to get going. They had their money, then the city put its money in and cost a lot of money, got grants and all like that, and withstood it, and congressmen fought it and all of that. I had to go get the grant of opposition, and um, that's what it looked like. Uh, and then this would look like the day it opened. The trees have matured now. But, um, you know, it's now, it might be the most loved place in our city. Uh, the citizens know it belongs to them. Uh, beautiful fountains, kids play in the summertime. And, uh, you know, when you design a park, the most important design decision is what is the purpose of the park? Because every park's purpose is different. You got to figure that out. And what we knew was that this park's purpose was it to be a thing of beauty a joy forever, and to give people in a bustling city a place of peace and repose. So it's a passive park. We have no events there. We have a wedding of 25 people or less. Do have any retail on it? It's just a beautiful place that people own. And, you know, you go there, and the, I walk on the our evenings and see everything from Frisbee, football, picnic, whatever, that's Miss and Ms. Gow. They're both deceased, uh, sitting on the bench. And got those swings. My wife and I, the only time we uh, can get in them is if it's rainy in a February freezing day because it's so popular, which thrills us. They love it. Now, uh, details are so important. So we, we're going to have a big gravel path. So I got into this gravel in my head that I wanted it to not just be ordinary, so they, it took a long time to design the park. So I, every place I went, I would look at path material. You know, I was at the Smithsonian. They just redone the old uh, building there. They had this new park and had really pretty gravel. And so I had, a, I had an envelope on me. So I knelt down and scooped a little bit into the envelope. And the security guy started coming after me. But luckily, I was a runner, and he weighed about 300 pounds. So he didn't catch me. But anyway, my, my people, I, they thought I was driving them crazy. I just had to find the right... So we came up with this mixture, see all those different samples. We had a lot more than that, but um, it was just perfect. Um, nice color. You can't tell too much there. You know, nothing overdone, but just it was an important detail because Charleston 
has a has a, a pastel palette. It needs just a little warmth there. And then we had the land behind the park that we acquired, and we figured we didn't know what to do. We, you know, in maybe uh, then office was in us close. We decided the best was residential, but had this fountain right there. You can see this very public. So that we couldn't be residential right there because it would conflict. So I came with the idea of an art gallery. So we got an art gallery with a residential above it. See, it's a wonderful penthouse up there. And, um, and then the art gallery is great because it's for beauty, but then it's right on the park. Then I had to arm wrestle the architects who designed the art gallery because they didn't want any windows on the art gallery. And because um, you'd got to hang paintings, but I said, there's no work of art in this art gallery as beautiful as what you see when you're in that building looking out over that fountain and the harbor. Then so we, we, we accepted the ethic. We did, I did. The committee accepted the ethic that the water's edge belongs to the public. So the port's going to redevelop that in a cruise terminal that will eventually get done. So public access will be along the water. But then I had one challenge with the tall building because we were building the aquarium on the other side of the tall building and then on this side of the tall building, we were going to have, you know, public access. And I needed to get in front of the tall building. But those who lived in the tall building did not want the public walk in front of the tall building. And I knew I couldn't condemn that. You, you got limits that you got to. Um, so I kept working with them. And then you just get lucky. And their bulkhead started failing, which was an expensive proposition. So we worked out a deal. I said, the city will rebuild your bulkhead, maintain it in perpetuity if we get a walkway in front of the building. And we worked it out so it closed at 9.30 at night and they got privacy and all like that. But it was very important. You know, I've been to a city um, uh, when I was thinking about this uh, in, on the East Coast and there was a really nice water's access and then you could see water's access on the other side of this building but there was a cyclone fence. You couldn't, like you were, you were just ordinary. You couldn't get, so I wanted, so anyway, we got this nice walkway in front of it, and it connects to the Maritime Center and where those palmetto trees are. It's going to be the International African American Museum. We're working hard to raise the money. It's going to be one of the great museums in our country, and we'll honor the, the history of people who were brought here and helped build this country. So we got that, and then on the other side is the aquarium, and then every place we could possibly get water is access along the water. This was a street that had no shoulder. We worked with the, all the permitting folks and built a sidewalk. And, you know, people would stop me and say, Joe, that's so nice what y'all did down there on Lockwood. You know, I, I drive into the city now just to walk or run along that. It's like their citizenship became more valuable and they didn't have to join anything. They didn't, they didn't have to buy anything. It was just, they were a citizen and they had another opportunity. And then on the other side of the Ashley River Bridges, we, I want, we wanted to build a baseball park on the water, so we did. And it was controversial, and they're expensive and all of that. And, um, but but it, was, it was be great, just be great to have it on the water. And, uh, you know, controversy, why do that? A lot of money and find another site. One of my opponents, when I was running for re-election, said, the mayor didn't tell you that he had to offer for free land out on the edge of town for the park. Ballpark. And I said, no, I didn't tell you that because free land is cheap land. Build, get, build something for the citizens, you get them the best land. Get them the finest land. So we built it, and it's just so joyful. They can see the water, and then you buy a hot dog behind third base, behind first base, and that's what you see. It's like an observation deck to national parks. So we work, we'll have waters access around the river. And then visioning is so important. This is a new bridge that was coming in, connecting the peninsula with James Island. No bridge had been there before, connecting. So it was going to bring a lot of people into the city preservation organization. They were going to have the aquarium at the other end of the street. Preservation organization said, Joe, do you have a plan for Calhoun Street? I said, no, we don't. I felt so bad. So quickly got the preservation organizations, the neighborhood organizations, the civic organizations, the colleges, and everybody together. And we planned a vision for Calhoun Street. Luckily, we had the vision for Calhoun Street, and the good friends of mine bought this lot, and they were going to build a max sleep and cheap motel. That's what it looked like on Calhoun Street. And I said, fellas, we can't build. Our plan says no motels on Calhoun Street. So they took it to city council. I won by one vote. 
kept the sheep motel from being built on Calhoun Street. County needed a new site for the library. He bought the land and gave it to the county. So you got a library instead of a sheep motel. Across the street was a surface park lot. The school board was going to leave. We got a school board building, the city offices on the top floor. So a civic building across from a library instead of a cheap motel across from a parking lot because the citizens demanded a vision. And they got a vision and they developed a plan for street. And this is the hotel that was uh, bankrupt and uh, um, it was for sale and the College of Charleston wanted to buy it uh, for a dormitory. Well, it's a hotel. It's a major intersection of Charleston, King, and Calhoun. It becomes a dormitory. What is a miserable light blanket? Used to be a good location. Used to be a hotel. Now it's a bad location. Best thing to do is a dorm. So I told the college they couldn't buy it for a dorm. I didn't own it, but I told them they couldn't buy it for a dorm. And, um, and they said, why? And I explained it to them. So then we got worked out a deal in development. We put 108, had 108 money in it, preservation tax credits and everything. Bought the land next to it, built a parking garage so we could have a hotel there where it used to be in this important corner. So we get the hotel built. This building looked like that and became that. Caddy Carter Cross Street, that building looked like that, became that. The revitalization about the King Street can be tied directly to the Francis Mab, which is a really nice hotel, being restored, blocks restored. Then across the street was this uh, park that was never found a place in the city's, you know, embrace, if you will. We got great landscape architects that looked like the Dickens, transformed it into a public garden, for lack of a better word, and farmer's markets on it and fountains we put in it and... The, uh, uh, 9-11, you know, the America was heartbroken, also wide about public space. And I said, the way we're going to observe this is we're going to glorify public space and build fountains and embrace the, the right and the need for citizens to, to be safe and to enjoy beautiful public space. So it's one of the most loved places in a city as well. And then the tax base going up around it, uh, hotels and tremendous investment um, because it's a beautiful park and wonderful celebration at Christmas time. And then moving towards the end here, believe it or not, this is a small city. When I was young, we were always seeking to get tourists, and they would come during the springtime to see Rainbow Row and the flowers in bloom. And then they started coming more frequently and in larger numbers and all year round, and there was neighborhood unrest. So I knew we had to work something out. You don't want to have neighborhood unrest in a city where people come. And so we, we developed America's first tourism management plan. And the, I came to this understanding that what you do is you plan, you plan how you want visitors to use the city. And, um, you know, where you want them to go and, and on what terms. Because protecting the residential areas are important because it's just, but it also is what people want to come to see, beautiful places that people enjoy living. So we need a visitor center, and I got inspiration. I got inspiration from Fasana, which is a beautiful waterfront park, which is four hours. I got inspiration from Fasana for your um, visitor center for four hours, and we all inspire each other. I meant to mention that earlier. So this is the railroad complex. It was abandoned we got bought from the railroad and turned it into the visitor center. That's what that looked like. That became the visitor center. It intercepted people before they got downtown. People would so look so nice they'd have the picture taken in front of the visitor center. Nice place for buses to come in. We put vines around the sheds and all of that and put a model of the city on under the floor. So you'd walk in there and you'd know that you could, it was your scale, you could walk the city. And um, so then they'd feel like they could walk, and then we got the trolleys coming by so they could park the car and go where we want them to go and um, down to the shops. And it, and it also helped, it helped uh, 
it helped the institution of marriage in America because you see, um, uh, rather than honey, you park, parked on the street, it's a one-way street, we're going to get killed, no, no, no. No, they park the car, never have to have any of that d discussion, and then they take the trolley down and go and buy something nice. So it's been very helpful for the city and for the, you know, for marriages. You know. So, um, okay, almost finished. Uh, the civic realm is so important. Now this is what we call the four corner law. To your left is city hall, St. Michael's Church. To the right is the county state court system, which was also the first uh, capital of South Carolina. And then on the back, come and look in the other way, the federal courthouse on the left, and you can see the county courthouse, state house building. So the feds wanted to build a large annex in that space there that would have overwhelmed the street. So we told them no. And they said, well, we will move the annex, we'll move out of downtown. And I said, well, you do that, we won't have a three corners of law yet left. And so they were very hard-nosed. So I went around the corner and bought the old Piggly Wiggly building, gave the back of that property to the feds so they could build the annex and set it back off the street. Very nice. And then with green space. And then about a decade later, they needed some more annex and they were going to leave downtown, so had to work with President Clinton to get the money from GSA, so they restored these old brick buildings, put another piece of annex back there, and so we got the, the federal courthouse will always be in downtown. Then across the street, we had to move buildings to keep the county courthouse going because Hugo knocked their roof off, and, um, and this is a judicial standard. But, you know, when we're dealing with the county, they said what we need is the place for the new courthouses where you got a lot of surface parking. And I said, what's more important? To walk out of the most uh, important of all buildings in a democracy, equal justice under law, courthouse, into the ubiquitous sea of surface parking, or walk out into the most beautiful civic district in a city and hear the church bells chime. So we got the all those courthouses and all that civic center is going to remain. And that's the, the, how the state capitol looked like in 1791 when George Washington visited Charleston and got those plans sent to his architect when they were working on the president's home in Washington, D.C. You can see the inspiration of that. And then this is the exchange building. They paved around it. It's so bad. And uh, so we got a tree planted there, and then got a little street that had been closed, an open little street. And people said, why do you go to all the trouble with a little street? And I said, well, the little street used to be there. And also, a famous uh, planning professor, Alan Jacobs, at Berkeley, and he was planning director of San Francisco, said, he used to give his, his uh, students a grid of a city. They didn't know what the city was. Just a grid. And asked them to circle where they would like to spend time in that city. They didn't know what it was. They just saw the grid. And they would all circle the same thing. And it was where there were little streets and little spaces because they knew that, that they would be more in scale there. Um, then trees are so important. This is a tree we had a parking garage built for. We really built, had a really good, this is one park ride. It wasn't quite as pretty as we learned to do. And um, so I had this little space, and I wanted a tree planted to go out over the street. And then the people in the building, the space next door, were going to build an office building. And so I, they told to go ahead. But they wanted to put the architect would come and say, it's the only place to put the utility box where the tree is. I said, no. Then another one would come and say, the only place to put the uh, whatever. And, uh, air conditioning, no. And uh, but I knew that they would, after I was no longer mayor, they would get rid of that tree. So um, I got them. They, I let them take the tree out doing construction. They gave me seven hundred fifty dollars for a new tree. So we planted the new tree, but I needed to know it was going to stay there. So we had this dedication ceremony for the tree, and um, 
And it says, Arbor Day, 1984, it stands above a portion of the fortification wall that once protected the early Charleston settlement. Now, we're not sure that's where the wall was, but, um, <laughs> but I knew it was pretty close, and that gave me something so that, that now that tree arches way over the street, and you got other trees over it, and it seals the uh, thing, and then you walk down the street, and you hear the birds singing and the squirrels scampering rather than in a harsh uh, place of a city. In conclusion, so let's say we all, and you were so nice to come and give your time and show your zeal and love for your city to come here. Um, say we all agree about this. Is there political support out there for this, these, all of these issues, planning and preservation and good design? And, um, well, this is Burroughs Liquor Dealer, um, which I, I go to very infrequently. Um, <laughs> but um, I was there one time, and, and it's kind of a cool place because I know the guys. I knew the guys growing up. And, um, and they also, years ago, got permit from the state to wear guns, you know, in a holster and all like that. So they have these pistols. And, you know, it's hot in Charleston, so they don't have jackets. You just got a shirt and slacks and a pistol on your belt. So it's an interesting place. So I, um, so I went in there one day with my modest purchase for a staff party, and, um, and I approached the counter, and the guys behind the counter that I knew, they converged to speak to me. And we, we mayors and council members, that makes us a little nervous because they might be want to talk about something they don't like, you know. So I approached it, and uh, one of those guys said, uh, Joe, uh, you know what you did down there at Broad and um, Rutledge? And it was, that's what it looked like. And I said, yeah. And he said, um, and what happened was we were digging a water line, and a friend of mine said, Joe, I've got that, Doug, why don't you plant something? So our parks people came up with the plants. So instead of this, we got this. So one of those guys said, you know what you did down there? I said, he said, Joe, that's the prettiest thing I ever saw. Another fellow leaning on his pistol said, Joe, you know where I live, don't you? And I said, yeah. I didn't really, but I wasn't going to tell him no. And, um, you know, so I got the pistol right there. And um, he said, I drive two miles out of the way going home every night just to go and see that tree. Another one said, that's a big, um, whoops, another one, another one said, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm getting, uh, here we go. So that's what it looked like. Another said, you've got a, a beautiful oak tree you transplanted, and I said, yeah. And that's just what it looked like before, excuse me, and that's what it looks like now. And that's what those guys selling liquor, wearing pistols, wanted to talk to them about it. And then they actually got into flowers and then the design of a, a new building for Bland and the old. So the political support is out there. It's basic human. All right, is there public policy? And, and, uh, yes, the, uh, the public policy is this, that uh, cities are precious heirlooms that we inherit. And we must pass them on to future generations more beautiful than we found it. That was the Athenian city of. So we had blue, blue stone sidewalks we were putting into the waterfront park, and, um, and we hadn't had blue stone in a long time. So they, and the old blue stone obviously would be hand chiseled. So it had that texture and character, it was real old. So the new blue stone comes in and it's been cut by diamond saw or something, and they put it down and it just, didn't belong. I was heartbroken. So I called my past guy and I said, what can we do about this? So they came up with this idea of putting the torch around the edge of the bluestone and it rounds it. And then it feels just right. Just like it belongs. You know, it's just perfect. It's, it's perfect. Uh, that's how we treat our city. That's the public imperative. And then lastly is there a moral imperative. And the moral imperative is the, how I began this presentation, that a, a city should be a place where every citizen's heart can sing. When we were de designing the waterfront park, we had this lower portion that had once been a little pier, but had fallen into the mud, and they dug up the 
the stones and figure out something along these lines was there. So the architects designed this. I thought they needed a big railing around. They said, no. I said, people fall. No, Joe, they're not going to fall in. And, you know, and they'll sit on the wooden bench there, or they might even sit on the stone. That'd be all right. I said, all right. So we opened this part first. I'm jogging by there one morning at sunup, and there's a fellow sitting just like they said someone would do. Drinking a cup of coffee, sunrise. I didn't bother him. I knew him. He was, uh, his name was Clarence Hopkins. He's poor, suffered from epilepsy, had jobs sweeping up in front of a gas station, shining shoes, frequently had uh, seizures, and people knew how to get him relaxed so he'd be okay. So I saw him a few weeks later. And I said, Clarence, I saw you at the park the other day, a couple of weeks ago. He said, yeah. And I really had, I didn't know whether people would like the park, you know. And I said, well, um, you go down there often? He said, yeah, I go every day. I said, why? He said, it's, Joe, it's just so beautiful. And I like going there when the sun's coming up and, uh, and then the ships are coming in. And um, he said, it's just so beautiful. And, you know, um, the thing is, in the American city, what we have is, for most of our citizens, all they have. They haven't seen the sun set in the Pacific or the rocky coast of Maine or the Purple Mountain Majesties or Amber Waves of Grain. They, uh, all they have, and what they have, is their city. And when we were opening the Waterfront Park, which was two years after this, I've been looking for Clarence because I wanted him to come there. And I hadn't seen him, found out he had had a stroke from which he never recovered. But, um, but I got him invited. We had a front row seat for him. Handicapped van picked him up, brought him to the wheelchair. The family wondered why I went to all this trouble. And, um, and I wanted him there because I knew he would love it. And, and we were blessed. The Lord blessed us. It was the prettiest May evening, sunset, symphony orchestra playing, crisp, cool, perfect. But I wanted him there because I knew he would enjoy it. But I wanted him there for me and for all of us who worked on that park. People like you, civic-minded people who, it took a long time, almost 15 years, and I wanted him there to remind us why we did it and why we must do it and why, why you're here tonight and why we care about our city. Because Clarence Hopkins, when he was healthy, he'd get on his bicycle and go down to a public place of beauty and clothe himself with peace and tranquility as he began every day. And if we work hard to build great places and great towns and cities for the Clarence Hopkins among us, then we'll build great places for everyone. Thank you very much. everybody for being here and particularly want to thank Kevin Klinkenberg and Eric Brown for all they did to help put the seminar on. Thank you all and we'll see you in a couple of months for another version of Savannah Urbanism Seminar. <laughs>